Hey, what's going on? Welcome to Angular Air. I am your host, Justin Schwarzenberger. And on today's episode, we are going to be talking about Ionic. Uh, there's a new version, version four. So we're going to dive into that, see how that pertains to Angular and what we can do in the mobile space. So let's get after it. Let's say hi to our panelists first. Joining us today, we've got Alyssa Nichol. Alyssa, how's it going? Hi, glad to be here, everyone. <laughs> And we've got our uh, future um, theme song creator, composer, Austin McDaniel. Austin, what's going on? What's up, everyone? And by the way, Rocky told me to tell everyone hi. He couldn't make it today because he's chilling with the Miami Dolphins. Um, but he said he would rather be here with us. Um, he just had an obligation to go. Yeah. Yeah. So we miss him. <laughs> All right. And our guest today is Mike Hartington. Mark, Mike, how's it going? Uh, it's going really well. Uh, just hanging out, loving to say hi to some familiar faces. Well, we are stoked to have you here today. We're going to be talking about Ionic. Uh, you know a little bit about that, right? I, I, I like to think I do. Uh, somehow I, I learn something new from the community, though, every day. So I don't know who's the real expert. Yeah, that, that tends to happen, but that's good. We get this collaboration, right, from everybody. Why don't you uh, give our viewers a little rundown of, of who you are, so in case they don't know who you are. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, I'm Mike Hardington. I'm a developer advocate for Ionic. I've uh, been involved with the company and, like, the framework and everything for, feels like almost, actually, it's almost five years uh, since early 20, uh, late 2013. Um, yeah, I've been involved with them for a little bit and uh, doing a lot in the mobile dev space. Everything from native iOS, native Android, to this new progressive web app stuff that's coming up. Yeah, it'll be interesting to talk a little bit about that as well, too, how the PWA story fits into there and into mobile and stuff, too. Cool. So what... Uh... Spoil... Go ahead. I was going to say, spoiler alert, it, uh, it works really well. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. So, what um, what is Ionic? We're talking about Ionic. Like, kind of, can you give us a quick rundown of what that is? Sure. Um, so, Ionic is a UI kit for building uh, apps that can be deployed on iOS, Android, the web, or on desktop with things like Electron. So, it's a UI kit that pr provides all the gestures, animations, uh, interactions that you would expect from, the comp from a component and from a uh, whole design system, just uh, packaged together so you can use it in, you know, whatever framework you want. In most cases, Angular. And is the idea that then the UI is handled to to match the environment that it goes to? So, like, if a guy goes to iOS or goes to Android, that it'll have that native look, or is it something that we bring our own UI to that's then common across all? Yeah, so it does try to copy what the native platforms are doing. So if like Android comes out tomorrow with a completely different version, we update our styles and our UI interactions to match that. If you load it up on, say, an iOS device, you're going to get a iOS looking uh, app. But if like loading it up in Electron or on the browser, we think material design's a good default. Some people might say that. I, I argue that not but we load material design in the browser and um you know provide that you know decent experience across all boards how's this uh different from something like uh, uh what's that thing native script so uh differences like ionic itself is all uh, html css and javascript so every component that you're creating uh it's a glorified div at the end of the day. You're just generating a, a valid HTML. You can load it up inside your browser, do some quick debugging testing. If you want to touch native features, then you can start migrating over to the native devices. But it's still just HTML being rendered. Good question for you. This is kind of off topic. Why do we call divs divs? What is that name for? That is a really good question. <laughs> and I. I'm not going to be able to concentrate without thinking about like, why is it called a div? 
<laughs> Somebody better Google that really quick and find the answer. Is it like dividers? Yeah, I don't know. Making some stuff up. It's division. Oh, division. All right. DeLorean. De yeah, okay. Doggies. All right. So um, <laughs> yeah, now, now, now we've derailed and, and lost our focus. What um, what I uh, so if we're do we only want to make use of like ionic and, and approach that if we're targeting mobile space? Uh, is, would that be the case? Like if I'm an Angular developer and I've got an application, um, it, would I only be looking at ionic if I was going to say want to target the mobile space specifically? Um, I would say no. Uh, if you if you are developing uh, developing something for uh, you know any website design patterns across mobile and design uh, desktop are getting a little bit closer together where you can take that same form factor and move it across to the desktop. Uh, and Ionic is a perfect fit there. We come with like all the utilities for creating that responsive layout. So that way you can have like that two split uh, split uh, view layout with like one detail list and then the whole entire list of all your emails, kind of like an email client. Um, all responsive breakpoints, grids, and everything, so that way you can resize your page and have your layout flow uh, as you would expect. So it's kind of like a uh, component library that has shims for mobile type things. I think when we when we first started, our initial goal was to be like the Twitter bootstrap, but for mobile. And now that we've kind of moved over from just like not just mobile to the desktop, it's like it's even closer to the bootstrap because we, the utilities and like grid components and like all the CSS stuff in there really allow you to build like full desktop apps and also small mobile apps with the same code base. That's interesting. So it, everyone, when you leave this uh, convo, just when you think of Ionic now, you just think of bootstrap. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly what he said, not taken out of context at all. <laughs> no, no, no. Nothing's taken out of context. <laughs> I just tweeted that, by the way. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it went viral. All right. So um, you mentioned that now we can target desktop apps as well like with Electron. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, Electron. Okay, so I, I kind of start thinking then if, if we're doing that and we're working this Ionic it, and we're building like an Angular app, um, are we just doing our regular Angular stuff that we're familiar with, like making components and, and, and things like that? Or is there uh, language specific or domain specific stuff that we need to know for Ionic to leverage stuff? Or how does that work in that workflow? So everything, um, so a little kind of backstory, like, Previous releases, we it would have been a very Ionic specific approach to things. Uh, like we had our own approach to how to handle routing. Uh, we had our own approach to how to handle like building the app itself. Um, but with our 4.0, we've kind of made that switch to dive all into Angular's ecosystem, like using the Angular router, using Angular CLI, and um, building all on top of all that. So your like route configuration. That's all Angular Router stuff. Uh, building components, it's all Angular components under the hood. Uh, and creating like all these overlays, like alerts, modals. That's all just calling Angular injectables and handling that. So we try to play really close to using whatever Angular says we should do, how we should do things. So if you want to route, you're using Angular Router, and you just happen to be loading up Ionic components. So, uh, you know, Ionic came out with this thing called Stencil. I, hopefully, I'm not like jumping ahead here. Uh, mm -hmm. Called Stencil JS. How does that fit with this like Angular paradigm here? So, Stencil for for most developers, they don't even need to know what Stencil is, or like think about it, or have that in their thought. Um, we built. We wanted to build our components in a much more efficient way. And what we found was we want to build things as web components and then also be able to ship them as Angular components. So Stencil is our build tool to write 
in an abstracted web component and then ship them as Angular components. It's a really kind of like high, high, high level uh, description of like what it actually does. But the good part is like most people don't ever really need to think about that if they need to. So I guess I'm still trying to kind of wrap my head a little bit around it. So the the concept is that we're writing um, stuff, we're, we're creating like Ionic components and, and Ionic application code. And then under the hood, it's converting it to Angular code or, or whatnot. Um, is that would, would it help if I would it help if I showed uh, like a demo or like a screenshot of like Yay. an app? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. That that'd be great. Cool. Yeah. So and, and while you're getting that set up uh, in the YouTube chats, uh, people are asking to let you know that the community loves stencil and they use it all the time. So <laughs> that's awesome. And. I think we just lost them. <laughs> no. <laughs> no one knew what I say that again. <laughs> hey, no Mike. one knew what div is in the in the channel. Yeah, <laughs> Matt said that it, it stood for HTML content division element. Oh. <laughs> well, let's try that again. <laughs> so, Mike, did you hang up on us, Mike? <laughs> Uh, I was just letting you know right before we, we lost you for a second there um, that uh, in the YouTube chat, people are saying that uh, to let you know that the community loves stencil and they use it all the time. And I think I think it's like when I say stencil, he automatically <laughs> drops. But I don't so I'm going to tell him you what tell. you're trying to say next time. <laughs> right. <laughs> because like, you're cursed. <laughs> like Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Right. It's like the opposite, he disappears. I don't know. No more talking. You, because <laughs> we're gonna lose all our guests. <laughs> oh, uh, I so I've never been disconnected when trying to screen share. I wonder if he's doing the right thing. Let's see. Yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe hangouts. So maybe maybe we'll have to not do a demo, right? <laughs> Hi, hey, Mike. How's it going? Hey, Mike. So, Mike, before you leave us I'm again, do show a demo. <laughs> um, that was fun. So, I've never had that happen before. Yeah. Did you like try to screen share and then it just disconnected you? Yeah. Okay. That's that's what you want. That's, that's <laughs> exactly what I wanted, and I'm not going to try it again. Okay. So we're just gonna we're just gonna assume that I showed the demo and it went really well. Perfect. Perfect. But, but, yeah. So what I was trying to say. <laughs> Justin wanted to tell to you, and you kept disconnecting was that the community was commenting and saying that they love stencil and use it all the time. So we believe that n now we can't really mention stencil anymore because you'll leave us, so. <laughs> I'm still kind of confused what stencil is. Okay, well, but first maybe we could talk about like- you share your screen? <laughs> we can talk about this uh, Ionic development experience. Like, so right. what we'd expect if I'm going, I want to build an Ionic app or components or whatnot, like, like what would I expect to? So, so if you if you are an Angular developer and you want to develop an app and use Ionic, it's like including any other third party Angular library. Go up on npm, npm install at Ionic Angular, pull it in, include it in your root app module, and you have all the components available. So that be all of the um, like our components like header our list items, all of our slide carousels, as well as all of the like providers that you can use to generate like overlays, modals, alerts, and everything else. So your development experience uh, is exactly the same as if you were coming in from another Angular project or another using another Angular library like NGX Bootstrap. All right, okay, so I think I'm following. So it's kind of like like material, yeah, or just like you said, bootstrap and stuff like that. So I bring that in, then I have this suite of components and services and things like that I can use. And then I have like build scenarios that I handle to to target those things and go through. Mm -hmm. Would that be correct? Or how does that work? So for most cases, we uh, we extract all that using our own kind of like CLI under, uh, on top of Angular CLI. So if you are building a project and you want to say add, want to target, say, iOS, native iOS. 
you would just run a command. It would add the native iOS project structure, include any native uh, tooling that is needed, <clears throat> and then it would automatically uh, handle building and compiling the native project as well as the Angular portion, which is under the hood just calling Angular CLI. Oh, so it's not like every change you make to your app, you're running a build command for like creating the iOS project. You're saying it's doing that behind the scenes once you get it set up? Once you get it set up, it'll go ahead. You create that initial project, right? And that just pulls down, creates a native project itself. Then you can go ahead, build the, uh, the web app portion, like your Angular app portion. And then that gets bundled into the iOS project, which then would create the native uh, app itself. Um, and it's the same thing for Android. And so then is that something I could add, like if I have an existing Angular CLI project and I add to that, or would I start a whole new like repo or project with an Ionic app sort of concept? No, you can actually add to it. Um, we, uh, I, w I went through the process of creating uh, an ng add schematic. So it'll go through create, uh, you can have your existing Angular project run ng add at Ionic Angular. It'll pull down all the dependencies and all the tools that you need. Um, the only thing that it does not add is our global CLI, which handles creating the project. But that can be that's a simple install on yourself. Cool. Cool. And then so like if I have my existing app and then I already have some UI and functionality in it, and I say I want to start making use of Ionic. Um, if, if I have my own kind of design layout um, for my application and I'm taking on these Ionic components, like w would I be looking at going, okay, I need to like think about changing my design to take on what Ionic does or fitting it in or like, because kind of mentioned was... that it's kind of similar to kind of taking the material approach. So is it, was that the case where I'm thinking about this, this design layout of my app? And if I take on Ionic, I've got to make these decisions about it or... What? Does that make I wouldn't. Sense? I wouldn't say. So it depends on how far you want to go. It's like there's that scale of do you want us to control the layout and like flow of everything, which we can, or do you just want to pull in, say, a couple buttons, uh, a toggle switch, or a, a card component? Right. You could pull in pieces that you want and say, okay, I want to change this Ionic card to fit my design or I can change my entire design to fit in this kind of platform agnostic or iOS and Android kind of material design and iOS design uh, guide system that they've provided. Uh, but like customizing components itself, uh, it's all done through like CSS variables. So it's pretty easy to do and be able to change that uh, on the fly. I absolutely love CSS variables. That is like the best thing that's came out of the web that was like, <laughs> why are we not doing this thing for so long? It's, it's probably one of my favorite features as well. Um, if only for the fact that I can make dark mode and just yes. have it work. Heart to the dark mode. Dark mode, <laughs> right. Yeah, all right, all right. Dark I, mode, and, everything. And dear GitHub, uh, there's this thing called CSS modules uh, or uh, CSS variables. Uh, please create us a dark mode. Thank you. You guys are so weird. I'm like light mode Thank all you. the way, but that's why I'm blind as a bat too. So keep keep going. <laughs> something something Batman Bane. I didn't see light until I was already old enough and it was blinding. <laughs> I was like spot on, man. <laughs> I do pretty well. So then I, I could see this as being something valuable where say I have like um, some type of input, right? Um, date picker or something along those lines that uh, I'm, I'm, I've got in my application and I'm going, okay, I want to target mobile. I want to target these different platforms, but I don't want to deal with all of that, right? And I'm assuming that then I bring in Ionic, I can make use of something like that or um, some type of form element or something and now have the confidence that I don't have to worry about, you know, setting it up for all these different you know, nuances for the different target environments. Would that be correct? Yeah, yeah, it's exactly right. And, you know, so those different platforms and those different targets, they all have, like, small ch differences, but it's, like, a million tiny differences that all really matter. 
And so like all of those have been accounted for and like we dive real deep into some of the uh, native components and figure out like how can we get this web component or this web uh, UI like one on one to one like the same exact uh, thing. Yeah. Yeah, I can totally see the value of that. I mean, in terms of thinking like, okay, I've got this Angular app, like why would I want to bring this in? Um, if I have any kind of inclination that I might be targeting these different environments, um, super valuable. Uh, and, and I think like, it's not just if you want to target these different environments. Like if you're if you're making an app and you want to deploy it, but you want like just halfway decent components, I think Ionic is like a really good uh, candidate here. It's, not just that it's halfway decent, it's really nice components, but they're all, you know, it takes a lot of the hard work that developers would have to do, spend their time creating the components, the styles, making sure that's performant. Uh, it fills in all of those gaps for you. Yeah, we talked a, a little bit in, on the last episode uh, about like um, component APIs and like input and output and the things that kind of go into when you craft those things to be able to reuse them and stuff. And so um, just kind of to what you're saying, you know, have a, a library that provides that and has handled a lot of that stuff, right? That then you've got this these nice component APIs and things that, that we don't have to hand craft and we can just roll with and, and tweak and stuff. So then are you, uh, so it's also kind of like, layout stuff as well you kind of talked about routing and and maybe like page view kind of structures right list detail and things like that is that's something that that ionic provides is that correct yeah so on top of like the lower level kind of like ui components we have like some structural pieces um where we can say i have i have a route like the highest level one i can think of is our we have a customized router outlet that provides page transitions between each component. So if you go from page one to page two, on Android, it'll navigate from the bottom up. And on iOS, it'll do the slide in from the, from the side. But then it'll also handle being able to swipe back on iOS, uh, which is you know, something really nice. Uh, we have those. We have header components, grid components, uh, a split layout component, which um, is basically my go-to component every single time I need. I know I need something that's going to work on a desktop because it just handles that. As soon as it hits that breakpoint, the other piece just kind of pops out and it creates that nice uh, UI that people are used to. Yeah, those are uh, definitely things that take time to to hand roll right and to do. So right. It, and then, like you mentioned, the just the little million differences and things that that are under the hood that you have to account for um, if you're going to hand roll and build them on your own. So uh, definitely a big sounds like a big win there. There's a there's a fun story somewhere in there, fun of uh, going through and trying to figure out how can you make a box shadow performant and not cause any layout uh, thrashing or jank. You just go in there and it's like, if I was a developer, I don't think I would, if I wasn't like a your average developer not working on a UI framework, I don't think I would pay attention or know that some of these things are things you should be aware of. Yeah. For sure. It's always crazy. I, I always think it's crazy when you look at and doing like web development and you approach something and you see it and it's like, oh man, this looks like it's going to be pretty quick and easy to build. And then you dive into that, just see that e even little pieces. And all of a sudden it's like, oh man, there's just a mountain of things to try and dial in and, and cover cases and all this stuff. It makes it fun, I guess. Right. But uh, always challenging. There's, there's something new every single day, right? Right. Uh, so we have a question if we have time for one real quick by Ajon. He, he asked, do you still use Angular router guards uh, with your Ionic 4 router? That's a really good question. Um, yeah, so and it's the router outlet component itself builds on top of Angular router. So you still have access to all of those uh, all the router API information, so router guards, lazy uh, lazy loading APIs, um, everything that you basically know from the Angular router is still available. So you say it builds upon it. Is it like a, um, is it inheriting from it, and it's got all the the different stuff? Or I guess that's digging a little deep. But like, if, if I'm going to use it, like, what would be the like? 
can you just briefly explain like how I would be using that in my code, the Ionic router? So it, it's less Ionic router and more it's just a single router outlet component that we've written. Now, based on that, it creates this whole stacked navigation layout, which we don't have to dive into that, but it essentially creates an API that just reads the router config and uses the router's API to basically work with the rest of your app. So if you want to go programmatically, say, navigate from page one to page two, you would still be using the router calling navigate by URL or navigate and passing the URL or uh, com the URL slug. So router API and like how you interact with different components and how you navigate around, it's still the exact same Angular API that you would be used to. Uh, we just take care of some of the transitions and how those components get uh, animated in. Cool. Very cool. So then, yeah, I think we have a, a lot of other stuff, like I think diving into like stencil and, and web components as well as diving into the PWA stuff or, or two yes. things that um, I, I don't know, I'm real anxious to hear more. I'm, I think other people are as well, but um, you know, we still have a whole 30 minutes. So I don't, maybe we need to cover some other stuff first before we dive into those. I don't know, whatever you guys think. Yeah, let's go. Let's go for it. All right. So maybe that maybe let's start. Um, how about let's start with the stencil and the web component stuff first, and then maybe we'll build our way to PWA. Sure. Um, so yeah, like a little bit of what I, like I was saying earlier is like we we at Ionic like we want to use web components um, for you know several reasons. One of them just being because we could take our core UI and ship it to, say, different frameworks or use no frameworks if that was an option. We have a lot more flexibility. Uh, and Angular Elements wasn't uh, something that existed at the time. So we, we ended up rolling our own solution with that. Uh, and being able to generate a kind of abstraction API on top of web components, where you're not really writing a web component itself, you're writing this representation of what a web component should look like. It has familiar things like, has, instead of inputs, they're called props. Um, instead of outputs, they're just tagged as event using decorators. And being able to take all that and generate a fairly uh, self-contained web component, and then also be able to create some tooling to generate the Angular wrappers for that. So Ionic components exist as Angular components, which just pass all the data and information down to the web component. But it also creates the uh, like the services and controllers for being able to create overlays uh, dynamically. So it handles all of that for us. Um, and it's basically a tool that you know we needed and wanted and built. Very cool. And then, and then is that like a small payload that we get out of there when we build those things? Yeah, so they they end up being very self-contained. Um, so if you are generate, if you're like, we have over a hundred components and uh, uh, pieces inside of Ionic's own toolkit, and it would be super expensive to try to like say, hey, download all of this upfront. Um, so our core like Ionic module when it gets generated just has a little bit of information about all the components and just some type information. Well, it goes in and it renders out and sees, hey, I see ion card in your template. Hold on a second. It goes and it will fetch that code for us automatically without the user having to configure that. It'll provide that code for us and load it in, um, kind of doing its own lazy loading, but just not having to be set up by the developer. So, so, all so you mentioned that uh, you know you guys kind of started this before Angular Elements, um, and, and now we have Angular Elements. Is that something uh, you know that you're you're planning to circle back to and, and kind of you know level up with Angular Elements, or you kind of want to keep going down the path of of Sentinel and and what does that future look like for the framework? I think there's definitely some room for cross collaboration of ideas and 
sharing different, uh, you know, hey, this worked well for us and this worked well for you and kind of getting uh, getting in a room, like sharing those ideas. I think there's also different needs that Angular has and that we have as well. So, you know, we probably are going to stay with Sensel just because it fits what we need um, versus Angular Elements, which is meant to be geared towards all the Angular developers. Like, we don't necessarily need dependency injection uh, for our stuff. So we don't need to pay the, uh, we don't need DI, so we just don't use it. Um, different, to, different uh, you know, a thousand little differences that really just make it, well, we'll just keep our own tool. But Angular Elements is still a really good solution for your Angular developer to generate web components. It's interesting. So, so I would really be thinking about those two things separately. You're saying that if if I was building with with something in stencil, then I'm kind of like not thinking Angular at that point. Would that be correct? Yeah, I, I would say it's it's got some hints and some Angular influences, but it's not really something that you would be thinking. You know, oh, this is this is pretty much essentially Angular. Like, there's no dependency injection. You're writing JSX. Um, which everyone has their opinion on it. I mine's, I don't like it. Uh, but there are different like there are different ideas, but they still have similar end goals. So you mentioned there's no dependency injection several times. <laughs> I feel like you might have an opinion about that. <laughs> um, but you know, a better question would be like. How would uh, you know providers and things like that? How how is that handled in, in, in stencil and alternatives to that? So, I can only say like how we answer like how we handle it when going from our vanilla web components to the Angular like translation layer, um, and that is we have a base uh, provider that will go ahead and create uh, our components. What it, how it works at the core web component level is that there is a controller component. So say we want to create an alert. We have an ion alert component or ion alert controller component, which will go ahead and create the ion alert itself. And then that ion alert controller is just cached in the DOM. So there's no like paying the extra cost of having to reinstantiate it. And we can keep that around and just create the alerts as we need it. Uh, and that's essentially what the services and providers inside of Angular are doing, just abstracted away in Angular's uh, services API. And now we could think about building web components in Stencil and then consuming them in our Angular apps. Would that be a possibility? If, if that's the route that you want to go down, uh, the way that we've been looking at it is that if you are part of a company and you want to have a consistent design system across all your teams, but you don't want to enforce what tech stack that they are using. Like if you want, if some teams want to use Angular, some teams want to use a different framework or no framework, they should still be able to abide by those different design decisions. And this way we can create that component once and have it work for each one of those frameworks and maintain uh, you know, kind of feature parity between all of them versus right, like React date picker, Angular date picker, Vue date picker, all the right. same thing. Yeah, I can imagine, like, let's say I had, um, I wanted to build like an image uploader that, that allowed you to pick a file from your system and, and then show you a preview, thumbnail preview of that image that you uploaded. And I wanted to be able to, you know, build that in house and, and share that across. Like you said, we have a team that develops in React, a team that develops in Angular, and get them to use that. So I, I would imagine I could use something like Stencil to build that web component, right? Um, and then consume that in those different platforms across what we're targeting. Yeah, more or less, that's, that, uh, that would be something that you would use it for. Cool. Cool, that makes sense. Um, so another question was asking if we talked about why they chose to use Shadow DOM, which I don't think we talked about. No. Um... Yeah, Shadow DOM's a fun thing. Uh, essentially, the the kind of the short version of it is it makes our components more resilient to breaking changes, or it makes users' code more resilient to breaking changes. For instance, like 
because like shout it out for those who aren't who don't know it's essentially a way to say hey i have a component and it has some inner html or like some stuff that it's going to render i don't want that stuff to be exposed to the user so if like you think a video element it has all the controls all the volume sliders like built in and you you don't ever see that um that's essentially what Shadow DOM does, you know, from like a thousand feet, like kind of glance over at it. We chose to use it to make sure that if people are going to be customizing it um, and doing all these deeply nested selectors, we want to make sure that there's like a proper API to customize certain components without breaking their CSS uh, if we decide to change like how the internals of a component work. So like a mixture of using CSS variables and Shadow DOM means, OK, well, we can lock down this component, make sure that it's going to be stable, and then use CSS variables to provide like a public API saying, oh, here is an ion card. You want to customize the border radius? It's a simple variable. You change that. You want to customize the box shadow or like just the overall width and height. Like You can change all of that and keep that component secure without having to risk breaking your user's code or breaking your user's apps. And so if I'm building my own Stencil JS web component right, or using Stencil JS, I don't know if I'm using the terminology right, if I'm using Stencil JS to build a web component, uh, do I have the ability, is it pretty clear cut to do those sort of things if I want to set up CSS variables and things like that um, for my component that I'm building? Yeah, so it will allow you to either say, I want to use um, no Shadow DOM, uh, I want to use Shadow DOM, or I want to use something called scope styles, which essentially just generates a unique ID for each one of the components. Would that be similar to how uh, Angular does it? More or less, yeah. So it's exactly like Angular's like view encapsulation and how it handles renaming things uh, to a specific string. Cool. That sounds like it'd be kind of familiar. Easy to kind of dive yeah, right? In, right, right, yeah, yeah. Very cool. All right. Um, anything else on stencil, or are we going to get to PWA? Uh, there's just one last question that was asking if there are things that aren't exposed they want to customize. Um, should they create a pull request or just create a new like thing with stencil for themselves? That's the go-to answer there. Pull requests are always welcomed. Um, <laughs> like every like every open source developer, we we live on pull requests. And if you can send <laughs> one, two, or three, uh, we would greatly appreciate that. There's there's a never ending list of issues. Never. <laughs> I, love ends. That, I love that. I love that. One, two, or three. Like four, no. We're not gonna take four. But like one, two, or three, yeah. It's like <laughs> four. There's only so many hours in the day. Five. We're just a whole week work. Did scientific studies, right? <laughs> Very scientific studies. So okay. what else did you want to move on to, Justin? Did you have something? Well, before PWA, you just mentioned uh, the open source scenario. I guess, yeah, that maybe we didn't really talk about that. Like, is this open source, or how does that, how does that work? Uh, it is all open source, MIT. Uh, contribute to it if you want. Don't give us credit if you don't want to. Use it how you want. All right, cool. That's always important <laughs> to cover, right? Uh, when we're thinking, I mean, at least I, I kind of think about that when I go to consume third-party libraries and things like that, or, or like, oh, wow, Ionic, it sounds awesome, right? Let me make sure I know what I'm getting into. Like, am I going to be able to, you know, flex with it and all this stuff? So, okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, well, like, Austin, you were mentioning it earlier, but like earlier before we started, it's like, I don't think, I don't think I've ever thought about that, but I can imagine that conversation like happening so many times, like, other large companies, it's like, oh, that license isn't right. It's like, well, okay, guess that. Guess that's an issue that more people face than I never would have thought about. Yeah, I think one of the the challenges you think about is going, okay, if I decide to, you know, embed and make use of this technology from this other third party, um, you know, how long are they going to be around? How much support are they going to have? Like, what am I going to feel like if if two years down the road, I'm I'm really, you know intertwined with this technology and they decide to close shop or, or just abandon the project, right? Um, so things like that. And of course, when we talk about open source and those type of licensing, at least gives you a little bit of the comfort that says, hey, 
at least I could go grab it and then start, you know, continuing it on internally if we really had to, right? Sort of thing. So exactly. All right, PWA. This this is really interesting. I think in terms of I, I'm trying to wrap my head around this, right? When I think about Ionic and targeting these different platforms and things like that, and I talk about PWA, progressive web apps. And I think, well, in that case, I'm just building native HTML, CSS, JavaScript stuff. Um, and I could get my PWAs to be running on these different devices, iOS and Android. Um, do I really need like a mobile strategy anymore? How does that all fit in here with this Ionic? Story? Yeah, or like, is Ionic the mobile strategy? Like what? <laughs> I, I would say Ionic is the, the one strategy to uh, rule them all. Uh, iOS, Android, mobile web. Um, I mean, we, we try to cover every use case that we can think of. Um, and when we, when we don't, we, we have a wonderful community that lets us know where we can improve and we improve on it and just iterate. But yeah, it's, once you want to target PWA, it just gives you so much more freedom than say developing for iOS or Android. Um, you can use whatever, whatever payment system that you want to use and not have to pay a cut of it to the, to the big companies. Yeah, I think that's like one of these concepts that we, we think about in terms of targeting mobile, right? Is like with the PWA, we're delivering just our web app in its own web space, right? And it's just like as if they're going to it in their browser and, and pulling it up. And so if we need to update it, um, we're not gate being gatekeeped. <laughs> you know, we don't have to go through a gate process to get approval for that update. You know, we can force updates right away. Um, like you mentioned, the, the paywall and things like that, um, we, we flow that through our own stuff. But we're in total kind of control of that app consumption by our end users through these mobile devices versus a, a native app where we have to go through a store and get that submitted and approved and, and update process, things like that. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, even just like without getting into like any of the any of the details of like how all that stuff like works, like just being able to like I have my PW like a PWA I wrote hosted on Firebase, and just being able to Firebase deploy, hit enter, and it's done. Like I don't have to go through the process of like generating certificates, signing it, uh, which no one really likes that part. Um, I know I don't, and uh, I've done it a few times, and it's never been a good experience. And it's just good to know that you know with at least. With progressive web apps and deploying it to a web server, it's just it's old school kind of like deployment process at that point but with just fancy technology. And so, what what are the, some of the things that we need to think about when we do these PWAs to kind of make them a PWA, right? And then, how does Ionic help us to do that more efficiently? So, like the whole PWA, like how do I PWA mindset? Uh, I think it's a, it's a bit of a misnomer. Like it's an unfortunate name because it makes it seem like you're building something that's not a website. Like all you're building is just a doesn't have to be a single page app. Most of the times it is, uh, but if you are building like an Angular app, congratulations, you can make that a PWA. There are some some things that you do want to keep in mind, and that's performance, uh, load times, offline capabilities. Uh, and being able to use things like uh, a service worker and app manifest. So like if you are starting your app and you want to go ahead or like you already have an existing app and you want to go ahead and make that a PWA, chances are you want to go back, revisit, use like tools like web page performance tests uh, and Lighthouse and Chrome to go through and like figure out, okay, how fast is my app on say a 3G network? With limit, uh, limited device capabilities, you got to make sure that your app at least loads in three to five seconds. The lower, the better. But try to remember that you, if you're loading with under five seconds, I would say that's a pretty good experience. Um, make sure that you're lazy loading, because if you're loading all that code up front, uh, you're not going to mit, uh, hit those metrics at all. Uh, this is, you know, another reason why we have Ionic the way it is, where it's lazy loading all of its components. Like we don't need to pay the cost for all hundred, hundred plus components that we have in our toolkit, plus your, uh, plus the app code that your users are writing. Uh, for this case, like 
if you're lazy loading that first initial route, uh, lazy loading your routes, um, making sure that you're using like tree shakeable providers, having everything kind of set up following, I would say, Angular best practices. This is pretty easy to do. Uh, then you can use things like Service Worker. Angular's got like Angular Service Worker package to pull in and configure Service Worker so that way you're not having to write it by yourself because that is not fun. Uh, there's also like Manifest, which is also provided and giving you like that enhanced experience inside of like your user's device. So status bar will be tinted. The browser window will show an icon. Uh, you can get all these really great things. Uh, Nionic just kind of takes advantage of all that by providing you a good baseline uh, loading experience with all of its components being lazy loaded. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. My, my mind kind of goes when I start thinking about PWA and the, and the parts of that, right? And I think, okay, mm -hmm. progressive part, like in my mind, I go, okay, that's like progressive enhancement, feature enhancement, things that, that as we go from browser to mobile device to slower speeds, that my application or my website is is handling those scenarios like you were describing. And then my mind goes, okay, well, then the, the app part is that part that kind of covers the manifest and maybe the service worker and things like that, the things that, that make it this kind of almost like an application sort of identifier, right? Um, mm -hmm. That is the web, right? And in our HTML right. and JavaScript, so that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because like, you could say that and think like it's covering all the key basics, but to to you know talk to a couple other devs, they're, they're still like, "What's progressive enhancement? How do I do that?" Like, there are so many like there's a I think there's a pretty big disconnect between like what people think PWAs are and what they actually are, and it's again unfortunate naming, probably some unfortunate marketing, but trying to get back and make sure it's like if you're building an, an app and you're building it in a uh, Using whatever framework or technology, and it happens to be X, Y, and Z, you're building a progressive web app. Yeah, I, I always thought it was interesting, especially when the PWA movement first started, because when I was reading through this checklist to create, you know, like turn your app into a PWA, I was like, well, like most of these things we should kind of already be doing. Like, so <laughs> it was, I, I think it's a great movement, and I love that it's picking up speed, but. I also was surprised that just more devs across the board weren't just kind of including these things by default. Um, so I guess that's why like, it needed to be a movement. <laughs> I found the one that was like the most like kind of head scratcher was like, your site should be hosted using HTTPS. <laughs> yeah, it was <laughs> like, I think that's like number one on the checklist. Wait, <laughs> wait we're, we're not doing that? People don't do that? And it's like it's not to not to like you know kind of look down on people who might have not known that that you should be doing that, but it's kind of there are there are some things like oh maybe maybe the maybe the average dev does not know that you should be using HTTPS or what are some of the benefits of that. So mm -hmm. it's it's an interesting kind of response to see how people react to different features of it. Yeah. Every time I hear the word PWA, I think of something like the NBA or something like that. <laughs> what? Like you just go to sports in your head? I don't. <laughs> yeah, because they're all they all have acronyms like that that are like three letter, like whatever. <laughs> so, so the NBA, uh, NBA PWA. The NBA of PWAs. Nice. Nice. I mean, hey, the best. right now to see if NBA.com has a PWA. Well, I was going to say, I think NBA uh, has an Angular application. They are. They yeah. are Angular. Oh, well, are they really awesome? Yeah. Uh, I, I guess the cool thing, though, about it all is that it all boils down to a, a common denominator, and that's living in the web, right? So right. we can always be excited about that. It's all just put everything on the web. Don't have to worry about native dependencies or native tooling. Just throw your stuff on the web. You'll be much happier. You'll have. Do you like native people? Hate us? <laughs> I'm going to tell everyone sadly the word. MBA is not registering service workers. What? Well, you probably have to be specific. Like, are you talking about NBA.com? Are you? Yeah. Flat what? You know, yeah. It's also so, not using secure. It's also it's also not using HTTPS. 
That's the big no no. Uh, 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 uh. Does, does Ionic, uh, if we go with, with Ionic, does it provide any of this type of stuff for uh, handling creating manifest files for us or service workers or any of that stuff? Or are we still, you know, have to do that on our own? So I we thought about doing some of that stuff, but I th Angular has a great PWA add on that you can use. So ng add at Angular PWA. And it'll provide a lot of that stuff for you. Where we saw the benefit inside of uh, with Ionic is creating the kind of lazy by default approach to building out your app. So in Ionic, when we when we want to generate like a new page, instead of like generating a component and then going through and adding that manually to a router, uh, we just have a what we call a page generator, which we can just think of as a component associated with the URL. So we would just do ngg page, whatever page you want. It would generate that component, provide that component with its own lazy loaded module system or setup. And then your newly created route would just point to that uh, module and lazy load that by default. So we figured that the benefit for where we can come in and add something is how can we get our users to be lazy in a good way? Like, how can they do things lazily by default without having to go through and provide a lot of this work uh, that they would have to do manually? Okay, I've got a, a tricky question for you. It's probably not tricky. You probably have an answer, but it's something that I my mind start I'm I'm starting to think about, right? If if I'm going, okay, I want to live in the PWA space, I'm gonna make use of Ionic, right? Um, but what happens when I want to take advantage of some native functionality on these devices? Like, and I hit a wall, I'm, I'm assuming there's going to be things that I can't do in a PWA natively, right? Like, how does that come into play? Does that kind of damper our PWA love here? Or, or how does that happen? Uh, depends. You want, depends on which path you want to go down. So like, traditionally, we've been down to like a wrapper set up through this project called Cordova where it would allow you to tap into some native device capabilities. Uh, and if you wanted to you make sure that you could deploy your app as a site and then also as a native app, you would want to do like some conditional, like if, if native do this, if web do that. Uh, we've started a new project called Capacitor, where each iOS, Android, and the web and Electron all have like share a same surface level API. So you would call that surface level API and then it would be able to handle, go do this on iOS, do this on Android, do this on web uh, and do this in Electron. So I think like good, a good one is the camera API. You would call like a, an abstracted camera API. On iOS and Android natively, it would use the native system it has to display the camera. Um, on the web, it would just use get meteor, uh, user media object or whatever the method name is. Uh, it would just call get user media and then display the like an overlay showing like the camera preview, more or less. So we figured out with capacitor we can we can reduce that kind of conditional like, okay, what can't we do or like what do we have to be aware of? Like so I would say look at capacitor if that's something you're considering. If not, you don't necessarily need to use those APIs. So I like this camera example. I, I think it's a good one. I want to run with that really quick. So yeah. if I have a PWA and I want to make use of the camera, what's that experience going to be like? Am I going to be writing that JavaScript to interface with the, the JavaScript stuff side of code? And then if somebody runs my PWA on an iOS device, like what am I in for? Does that make sense? When you say on iOS device, you mean on like mobile Safari or like a native downloaded app? No, like uh, like I've got my PWA and I'm I'm gonna live in the PWA space, and so now mm -hmm. somebody got my running my PWA on their iOS device simply went to my website and said pin to home screen, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I want to give them a camera experience. Um, what are they gonna see, and how am I gonna build that sort of thing in my PWA? Right. So in the PWA, like. <laughs> On the, like, if you're building it, like, vanilla, no, like, shim library, like, capacitor, you would just call get user media uh, and handle that. 
uh, you would get presented with the camera, kind of like your native iOS camera app. Uh, you'd be able to take a picture, confirm it, return, and it would provide you the data that came back from there. Uh, with Capacitor, if that object, if you are supporting get user media, or if the browser supports it, it'll go and just let the default API use it. Uh, but we also provide like a quick little shim to kind of hack it. Um, but for most cases, it's almost a non-issue uh, because iOS supports the native camera methods that you get. Uh, Android supports it. You know, it's basically you could just use the extracted API and get a nicer experience, more or less. OK, that makes sense. That makes sense. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, we're at the top of the hour. We're nearing the top of the hour, really, really close. So I guess we'll, we'll wrap it up. Uh, anyone want to add any last things on the PWA or we good go to picks? How's everybody feel? Yeah. All right. I'm going to take the silence as we're ready for some picks. So um, does anybody have any picks today? All right. Austin does. Alyssa? Yes, no. Okay. So Austin, we'll start with you, Austin. So um, my pick for this week is uh, something that uh, someone recommended to me. Uh, we all know that like building um, packages to like distribute uh, for open source and publishing on NPM and you know making sure that there's types and it's built for Node and built for WebAssembly and built for Web and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera is like a mega pain in the butt. Uh, there's this package I found called uh, Pika, P-I-K-A. Uh, and it's called Pack, and it basically is kind of like uh, if you're familiar with ngx build or ng builder or whatever it is called. Um, it's kind of like that, but it it expands on that to give you like um, you know uh, other targets, WebAssembly, Node, um, things like that. So that's my pick. Cool. All right, Mike. Do you have any picks? Um. I, I don't have a pick per se, but I do like I do want to give a shout out to two people in the community, uh, Mark Pizak and uh, and everyone's favorite Minko, uh, Minko for being so patient and helping me uh, as the last couple weeks with some issues and bugs and questions. Uh, thank you for letting me pester you on Slack. Uh, and Mark, he uh, wrote a blog post. Uh, setting up Angular Universal, and I've been diving into that recently. So thank you, Mark, for writing that blog post. Wow, those are two fantastic picks. We uh, we should get Mark on here. I don't know. I can't remember if we've had Mark on here. I think we might have had him on as a as a panelist or or as a co guest. But uh, Mark, if you're listening, reach out. <laughs> so <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, that's a wrap. Mike, thanks so much for coming on, sharing your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. For sure, for sure. All right, till next time. See you, everyone.